you guys are interested in listening to that. But next up is a really important question. What is, uh, what are rotten eggs, rotten fruit, and spoiled milk? Bad food. Or groceries. <laughs> How does an alien count to 23? On his fingers. <laughs> Gotta remember who, who offered some of these, okay? Uh, why do frogs make good outfielders? Why do frogs make good outfielders? Because they're excellent at catching flies. Okay, and then the last one, I think this is uh, seasonally appropriate. Uh, what did the tree say to the wind? Me. Leave me alone. There you go. All right. So today, we're going to be talking about hypersensitivity. Um, we haven't actually had a live lecture in a couple of weeks because we had an exam, and prior to that, we had an online lecture. So. We're going to be picking up from the specific immunity lectures where we talk about hypersensitivity. So first up, what, what is hypersensitivity? Any feedback from you all? What is hypersensitivity? How do we define it? So the only thing in there that I didn't agree with was the word normal, but, but um, having inflammation or, what did you say? Or a reaction? Reaction to bacteria that's not most people. That maybe most people may not react to. Okay, I like that. All right, what's normal, right? Show me a normal person. I'll show you something wrong with them, right? Like, yes, I'm overly critical, but there's no normal. It's all relative. Um, so this is actually a physiologic response. It is quote unquote a normal physiologic response. Like you want to have a reaction to something, right? It's part of the immune system. But hypersensitivity is when it's overly sensitive and it's reacting to something that it shouldn't. So it's taking a normal process and it's triggering it inappropriately. That's really what hypersensitivity is. There's nothing really abnormal about the process, it's the reaction part that's not supposed to happen, okay? So when we define it, we look at it being an immune response. It's an allergic response, which is an immune response, and an immune response is beneficial. Like last lecture, we learned that the specific immune system is there to protect you. So if it's an immune response, it must be beneficial but it has deleterious side effects because of the hyper nature or the hyper sensitivity. It's over and above what's normally supposed to happen and it results in tissue damage. So a patient becomes sensitized in hypersensitivity. That means that they're, they're exposed to the uh, antigen and now the immune system is triggered to respond or be sensitized to that antigen. It's inappropriately, I use the word inappropriately, meaning it's too much. It's too much when it's triggered and it's too much when it's maintained. And it's usually very difficult to control because it's a positive feedback system. Meaning once it gets triggered, it kind of exasperates over time. It doesn't necessarily diminish. So hives is a perfect example. How many of you have actually had hives? Or know, but know somebody who has, right? So you get an allergic response, and typically like 10, 15 minutes later, it's worse. It's actually much worse. And maybe it's to pet dander, or maybe it's to um, olive trees if you're down in, in the Phoenix area, or maybe it's pollen. It could even be ponderosa uh, pine tree pollen. And you have that response, and it, it actually accelerates. It gets worse before it gets better. So we have four different types of hypersensitivities, and you found this in the reading. And I want to mention something about the reading. Um, I actually was looking at last year's reviews. Why? Because I guess I'm kind of demented like that. Um, so I, I read these reviews when they come in, and then I go back and reread them. 
them just to make sure that um, there isn't something that your predecessors have said that would be um, insightful or helpful for me to be more effective. So I was reading through the, the reviews um, from last semester and I came across one in particular. Um, why is it related to the slide and where am I going with this? Um, because I just mentioned the reading, that's what triggered it. That's kind of how my mind works, right? Oh, something changed. So the reading in this particular feedback from the student from last semester, anonymous, don't know who it was, <clears throat> said, um, gosh, there's so much reading for this class. And I feel like it's like overkill. And so that was their feedback, that was their constructive feedback, like maybe you could shorten the reading. Well, the reading, my friends, is optional, but highly recommended, right? And if you remember back to the first day, like my philosophy is I want to expose you to a broad amount of information, right? That's my job, is to help present you with information. And so the readings are broad. Now the readings are limited. I don't say read chapter one through five. I actually give you specific pages. So I'm already kind of honing in what I think is more extraneous than necessary. But even from the readings, there's questions that are far more narrow on the three quizzes. And then we cover stuff that's very specific on the lectures. And then on the, again, the post quiz, we kind of broaden it back out again because you can do open book, open notes, open internet. But then when it comes time for the exams, I'm only gonna write questions based upon what we lecture on, not the readings, okay? But the readings, if you do them at the cadence of the class where it's, I do the reading, maybe over the weekend, class is on Monday, okay? Monday morning I take my free quiz with my reading open. Um, prior to that, I flip through the lecture notes just to make sure if there is an answer to the lecture notes, I know where to find it on the free quiz. And we show up to class, these four statements on the screen are not a foreign language. Type one, type two, type three, and type four. You may not remember exactly all the details about type three, for example. We're gonna cover it today. But you're not so stuck on, are we talking about blood types? Are we talking about personality types? What are we talking about? We're talking about hypersensitivity. And you know the topic and the general uh, aspects of what all this information is on the slide. This is a very valuable slide to study for the next exam. There are all sorts of test questions from this slide that I can imagine. Can you? And that's a great way to look at the lecture notes and study is, okay, he actually said, and I can prove it because it's being recorded, that this would be a very valuable slide to study, right? So maybe I should try to generate test questions on this slide for my roommate or for my study partner or in my SI session. That would be a really good practice because that's how I look at this. I look at this and say, okay, um, I could ask just a straight up level one question on, you know, what is, which of the following is a um, type IgE mediated response? And list one, two, three, and four. That'd be what we call a level one question. Now a level two question is where you actually have to think about it a little deeper. You know, like, so for example, I talk about type one, meaning that these individuals produce more IgE. That happens to be the lowest antibody that's in circulation of all of the immunoglobulins. And it mediates these allergic reactions and reactions to parasites. And it's triggered through an excessive histamine response. So if I asked a question about histamine release, right, which is part of the lecture of this slide, you would know the answer would fall into the category of IgE. So that's a second level question because I'm not just asking what is IgE, I'm saying what about IgE is unique, and that's the histamine response, that's the al allergy response. That's why if you have allergies to certain things, you take an antihistamine. Does that make sense? You take it, it makes you drowsy, but the antihistamine blocks the histamine response, and then if you walk into a house with cat dander, you're not like blowing up, you know, 400 pounds, you're swollen all of a sudden, right? So those are level one, level two questions. Level three questions might even go a step deeper as we move through the lecture and we'll talk about some of the mechanisms of a type one IgE mediated response. Do I expect you to answer all three levels of questions? Yeah, you can see certain questions on the exam, they're super easy, those are level one questions. Others require a little bit more thought and those are level two questions. And then the real difficult ones are the ones that are mechanistic and I'm trying to make sure that you understand how it works. 
okay? So just from this slide, we can generate like three level questions all on type one. And I've only covered 25% of the material on this slide. You with me? So it's a pretty important slide. All right, let's continue. Type two, tissue mediated. Utilizes IgM as well as IgE, or IgG, excuse me. Um, common responses here are gonna be blood transfusions. How many of you have donated blood in your recent past, okay? So we've been doing blood transfusions for 200 years, since 1818, um, successfully. Right? There were attempts before that that didn't work out so well. And we know that there's certain proteins or antigens that are expressed on a red blood cell. And they come in the format of antigen A and antigen B. Some of you have antigen A on your red blood cell, some of you have antigen B, some of you have both. And some of you have neither in your type O. And so if you donate blood that has antigen A to a person that has antigen B, you're gonna trigger a rejection, a hypersensitivity to that antigen A, okay? Same thing that happens with rhesus factor. It's a protein that's expressed on the surface of a red blood cell, they're an erythrocyte. Some of you have it, some of you don't. But if you do have it, you're rhesus positive. And so if you have it in your type A, you're type A positive. That's where that comes from. So A positive, B positive, AB positive, and then the subsequent negatives of all of those. And then you have your O, which doesn't have any of the AB antigen, but you could have the rhesus or not, so you could be O positive or O negative. If you're O negative, you're considered the universal donor, because you don't have any antigen on either category of AB or uh, uh, rhesus, so you can actually donate blood to anybody and, and everybody will be fine. So what's the universal acceptor? AB what? AB positive. AB positive, that's correct, okay? So type two is a great example if you do it inappropriately and you reject, that's because there's an antibody antigen rejection. We'll get into that, okay? Yes, sir. When you're talking about the blood transfusion, you always ask about red blood cells or white blood cells, or blood cells, or blood cells, or blood cells or uh, Yes, for the most part. So if any other type of cell is <laughs> That's correct. That's correct. You're talking about donating uh, organs. Yeah. 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 We're getting. That's type four. We'll get there. Where type two is, just to be clear, type two hypersensitivity is only referring to an antigen antibody complex um, where our an antigen antibody reaction, where antibodies are being made and circulating in the bloodstream. Uh, with transplant rejection, you actually have T cell interaction. And that's why, because you have that, but you actually have T-cell interaction, so we'll get there. So it's more complicated. But aren't, if I'm giving blood, aren't they giving all those T-cells? Uh, yeah, but not typically activated, right? There might be some circulating T-cells, but they're not in an activated state. And you would test for that before you, like the blood bank tests for those things, amongst others. Okay, type three. This is an immune complex mediated response, where you get an antigen antibody complex that forms, and that complex actually circulates around the bloodstream. We'll look at that here in a moment. And it usually gets stuck somewhere. And then, and some examples here are autoimmune diseases like uh, systemic lupus. Type four, this is what I was referring to earlier as being um, T cell mediated. So the first three hypersensitivities, one, two, and three, are solely B cell mediated. Antibodies are being produced and there's no T cell involved. So it's B cell mediated. Type four is considered um, transplant rejection and involves T cells. Now B cells could be involved, but because T cells are involved, it's called type four. This is a delayed hypersensitivity and 
in examples that we'll see are type 1 diabetes, where you're basically attacking your beta islet cells from your pancreas, and they lower their production of insulin now. Um, another example of type 4 are, is transplant rejection, like we talked about. And we'll get into some other examples here momentarily as we walk through the lecture. But first up, let's talk about type 1. So type 1, IgE median, it involves allergens. Oh, there's my mouse. Okay. Um, it involves a sensitization response. And what we see here is that the B cells that are activated help to stimulate CD4 um, activation. CD4 dash 2 is a subset of helper T cells. So in the last lecture, we looked at helper T cells being CD4 dash 1, or we just said CD4 uh, positive cells. CD4 uh, clusters have kind of two main um, nomenclatures. One is subset 1 that we looked at before, and the other one is subset 2. What you really need to know about that, they're basically cousins of each other, the CD4 positive helper T cell. And so you have CD4 positive subclass 2, or a subclass of helper T cells that are involved in a type 1 reaction. And the mechanistic process that transfers this um, response is by releasing these cytokines or these chemical mediators. So if you look here at the bottom of this slide, you can see and appreciate that there's an immediate hypersensitivity where you've got vasoactive amines that are released. This is minutes after the exposure to the allergen. And then there's a delayed response that's two to eight hours after the allergen. And all of this cascade is happening from these mast cells that are being activated and they dump their contents, mostly being histamine, but not exclusively being histamine. And if you back up on the slide, you can appreciate there's the allergen here, here's the lining of the nose, for example, the mucosal lining, that allergen binds, it binds uh, to a B cell that makes antibodies, that B cell triggers this helper T cell to be stimulated, now you produce antibodies that find their way to mast cells, that triggers the mast cell to dump their contents, known as histamine, or vasoactive substances. Now the story continues because when you have a second exposure to that allergen, it's usually far more aggressive. Now, if many of you have allergies, you don't remember what the first exposure looked like, okay? But how many of you are actually allergic to like bee sting, okay? Or have a food allergy, like to peanut butter, or peanuts, or nut allergy, okay? Um, some have a shell shellfish allergy, or maybe you're allergic to penicillin, okay? So you might remember those circumstances where the first time you got stung by a bee, like mom or dad was like, holy smokes, this doesn't look good. Better take them in, take her in, and they run some tests and the doctor said that they're allergic to bees. Try to keep them from being stung, right? If you're a bee farmer, that's a problem. If you're not, then you just kind of stay away from it and you might carry around um, like an EpiPen or a bottle of um, a Benadryl in your, in your purse or your backpack. So what happens on the second exposure? And, and so like in my house, um, I've got one kid that is, I've uh, got a shellfish allergy. And so like on Valentine's Day, we have a tradition where we, we, I have four daughters. So on Valentine's, we all dress up, they pick out my clothes, we all sit in the dining room, right? It's the only time of year you leave the dining room. Um, like, you know, Valentine's Day, Christmas, right? Easter, uh, birthdays, um, Thanksgiving. So we sit down in the dining room, it's all fancy, my wife makes everything all fancy. We bring out all the, all the like expensive dishes, you know, the stuff that collects dust the rest of the year and you have to wash before you use it, right? Because of sitting on the shelf for so long. And we have this tradition of, of making really great food and for a while we are doing um, uh, crab legs. Um, and we were doing like surf and turf. And for the first couple of years, she kept complaining that she didn't like the taste, and we always had this thing that we knew parents you don't have to like it, but you have to try it. Okay? You don't have to say that it's gross, you just have to say, it's not my favorite, but thank you for letting me try that. Okay? So that's kind of the, the practice, let's hear you practice that, okay? It's not my favorite, but thank you for letting me try it. Let's hear it, everybody. Ready, one, two, three. It's not my favorite, but thank you for letting me try it. Yeah, perfect, all right. 
Yeah, you're ready to prepare? Yeah. So anyway, so she's like uh, complaining that she doesn't like the way it, 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 it tastes or feels. Or, you know, I guess the texture. You know, kids are always about texture. Um, and then next year, we saw that she was complaining that um, her throat was itchy. And sure enough, like, she was getting red. And then the next year, she, like, ballooned out. We're like, maybe she's allergic to shellfish. <laughs> Not the best parenting moment, okay? <laughs> Took her in, got her tested. It only took three times to try, right? It only took us three times to realize we have four kids. Like, you know, we miss a lot of stuff. <laughs> you know, they're not bleeding and, you know, ex you know, exsanguinating and, you know, they're, you know, able to breathe on their own. But she was having trouble breathing, so that was a real red flag. Found out she was allergic to shellfish allergy. And so this is this second exposure. So what's happening to my little girl, right? Well, the next time this happens, you actually already have these IgE complexes on the surface ready for that antigen. And one allergen or one antigen is going to bind to two antibodies to trigger that response more aggressively and faster. And I saw it as a real experiment in my dining room <laughs> for three years in a row. And I didn't realize it until much later. Okay? So, how does this work? Well, we've got these mast cells that get activated. And again, backing up to the previous slide, they get activated because of these T helper cells, right? And um, their interaction with these B cells that make the antibodies. And the antibodies bind to um, the mast cell, the mast cell dumps, dumps their content. Well, if there's multiple antigen receptors, then that process happens more quickly and these mast cells can degranulate their contents aggressively. And that's what this word means is dumping out their contents so that these chemical mediators are bioavailable. Now the other thing that happens is they can actually manufacture new chemical mediators. And that's the de novo synthesis. So from scratch de novo, from scratch um, generation, they will manufacture histamine on the spot. And this happens after the second exposure. So the second exposure happens much more quickly and is much more aggressive. So what are these symptoms due to? Well, they're usually due to these vasoactive amines like histamine and other cytokines that are found within that mast cell. The symptoms that um, ensue are things like itching, uh, pyritis, uh, there'll be bronchiospasm, the bronchial airways will actually contract. There'll be laryngospasm, that's the back of the throat will contract. There might be itching on the back of the throat as well, especially if it's a food allergy. Uh, there'll be edema, that's the swelling that takes place. There'll be redness of the eyes. Nose will start running, rhinitis is the word for that, rhinitis, R-H-I-N-I-T-I-S. Patient can become hypotensive, meaning blood pressure actually drops because a lot of the fluid in the bloodstream is leaving into the tissues. So they become hypotensive, their blood pressure drops. That's very dangerous. Um, gastrointestinal cramping, could be diarrhea, of course, if there is a uh, food allergy. Um, there is tremendous cellular infiltration into the tissue, and there is a lot of tissue damage that can actually take place. This is all under type 1 IgE. Right? So allergies are a big thing. They can be really problematic. You also have excessive hypersecretion of mucus production that takes place um, due to one of the cytokines that's in the family of these vasoactive substances is called interleukin-13, <coughs> IL-13. And IL-13 comes from the mast cell and triggers mucus-producing cells to ramp up mucus production. Why is that? Well, usually if there's an epithelial interface, what the body's trying to do is create a protective barrier so more, no more allergen comes across, so that it makes more mucus at that um, outside the body interface um, by releasing more interleukin-13. Okay, what does this look like? Okay, so here is a picture. This is a normal larynx up top. This is looking down the larynx, okay? And this is my daughter's larynx when she was having this, um, yeah, I have a laryngoscope in my office. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is not my daughter's. Okay? You're like, that's messed up, dude. <laughs> that's not my daughter's. Um, this is actually a patient who suffered from an anaphylactic reaction to penicillin. And so you can see the airways actually close off, right? They narrow, 
We can see the swelling, the inflammation that was mentioned earlier. You can appreciate the extent of the inflammatory burden that's here because the tissue is swollen, it's edemic, it's inflamed, and it's also extremely red in comparison kind of to the lighter pink color that it normally is. Anaphylaxis is an aggressive response um, due to histamine release. We usually see this with food allergies, environmental allergies, that would be like uh, pollen or dust or pet dander, um, wasp or a bee sting or the venom that comes from those uh, organisms, as well as drugs like penicillin. Question. Um, so if all that IgE does is like cause these really severe allergic reactions, what's the evolutionary advantage of IgE? That's a great question. I don't have an answer for you. I'm not sure there really is an advantage. Um, you know, and again, is that a controversial answer? Well, maybe, but there's a lot of examples that we find biologically that you know people are scratching their heads trying to figure out what's the advantage of having it. I don't think there is one, right? I mean, what's the advantage of having cancer? Right? It's obviously evolved over time. And I don't I don't know of a single advantage to the organism for cancer being present. So there's a lot of those examples. So it, you know it's answering a question with a question, but I'm telling you I don't know. I don't know the answer. I can say this though. These processes are normal processes that typically would be defense mechanisms. Right. And so they're there as normal processes in case there's a foreign object or a foreign invader that you respond to it. But what's happened is there's been some breakdown over time and now we hyper respond to an outside invader. Where if the response to some of these things was 75% reduced and it wasn't uh, exaggerated the second exposure, it would be a minor, minor discomfort, but it may not be life threatening. And, and so, why did it move in that direction? I don't know. But there's a lot of examples biologically where we don't know why it evolved so aggressively. Um, you know, could there be beneficial mutations in the body? Sure, there could. That's all cancer is, is a mutation. So, are there potential beneficial mutations that can take place? Sure. I mean, I've watched the X Men movies. I mean, those all seem very believable. <laughs> Um, but obviously with cancer, something's gone too far, and I don't know why. I don't think anybody does. So you said uh, IgE levels are typically lower in like majority of the population, is that correct? Then, then people that are hypersensitive, yeah. Okay, so do they have more IgE for from the get-go, or they're born with Yes, they're born with more circulating IgE. So there are people, there are patients that are more susceptible to hypersensitivity via type 1. And usually their circulating IgE levels are a little bit higher than the norm, right? What's the norm? Well, there's a normal physiologic range. They tend to be above that. Um, and you can see that with um, a blood sample. So one of the symptoms for uh, type one, would you say it was perinitis, perinitis? Rhinitis, runny nose. No, the other one. It was pyrutus, pyrutus. itchy. Oh, yeah. Okay, type two. Moving on to type two. So this is um, where we talked about blood transfusion rejections, right? Type A, type B, type A, B, type O. O wouldn't be rejected unless it was O positive and you gave it to an O negative person, right? Or anybody that had, um, uh, that was negative for rhesus. But some other examples here um, that can show up on circulating antibodies are type twos that result from the production of IgG and IgM. And these are antigens that are typically found on the surface or within the cell itself. And so that's why we talked about the red blood cell example or the erythrocyte example. But there are other cells that have many specific antigens that are similar that um, uh, could actually bind to the plasma membrane causing a type two response. So for example, in this slide, we see at the top a patient that wrestles with um, a streptococcal infection of the throat. Okay, so they have strep throat. How many of you have had strep throat in your life? Very, very common. What do you do, right? You're like, ah, do I have like, ah, white caps on the back of my throat, right? No one's like, look for the white caps, which isn't a dead giveaway, but a lot of times it usually is an indication that there's some sort of infection in that lymphatic tissue. So you look for the white caps, they culture it, they put it in a petri dish, they run the test to see if it's positive for streptococcus, and 
And then what if it is? What do they do? They give you a, a prescription or a, a, a regimen of antibiotics. Well, that strep throat or that streptococcal infection is not just in your throat, right? It's circulating through and it's in your circulatory system. That antigen for streptococcal is in your bloodstream and it's probably in your lymphatics and that's why it took residence in your tonsils, which are lymphatic tissues. And these, these lymph nodes are filters and they collect this, um, this uh, strep infection and it, it exaggerates that response right there and it gets your attention. Um, so if the antigens are circulating in the body, so before there was um, widespread use of antibiotics, people will get over strep throat um, on their own. Okay, it, you, you don't always have to have a prescription. It happens um, to be that if you have a prescription, you don't have to wrestle with it as long, so it's much more convenient to get a prescription. Uh, you feel better faster, right, and it fights the infection, but your body is going to manufacture antibodies against that strep bacteria, okay? As it manufactures those antibodies, that antibody can circulate around the bloodstream. As it circulates around the bloodstream, it may bind to other tissues that have antigens that resemble strep, okay? It's not strep, but it's circulating around the body. So as it circulates around the body, it finds an antigen, for example, in the heart tissue, um, it may bind. It may bind um, to the heart valves, or to the papillary muscles. It may bind in the heart muscle itself, or it may bind on the surface of the heart, for example. And these are kind of the three common areas where we see with type two post strep infection, where we get a lot of these type two hypersensitivities. Patients are making their own antibodies to strep. There's antigens in other parts of the body, namely the, the heart itself, um, that have antigens that are very similar in design. Um, and so it binds there and it causes this um, inflammatory reaction. And historically, we've referred to this as rheumatic fever. Okay, so if you look at old medical journals or you watch old movies or you're a little house on the prairie fan and you know people are dying because they had a normal cold, these are some of the things that would happen back then. We didn't have widespread availability of antibiotics. A patient would get strep throat, for example. They would develop their own antibodies they would get over, the, the fever would break, right? They would feel like they're loose, you know, Junior was almost, on, was almost gonna die and the fever broke. And then years later, they have heart problems and they pass away at a younger age based on heart problems. And there's always this concern that there was some correlation between uh, this rheumatic fever that they had in the younger, as a younger kid and, and the incident of their heart problems later in life. And there is a connection, it's because of type two hypersensitivity. Okay, so let me just finish the slide, we have a couple questions. So this is cardiac tissue that you see here. On the right and the left is normal myocardium, okay? It's striated muscle, very similar to skeletal muscle. So normal heart muscle here, normal heart muscle here. This is a scar, and this is a scar that's isolated that's not because of a heart attack. This is uh, a scar that's isolated because of an individual that referred to this um, named Ludwig uh, Ashkoff. And so these are called Ashkoff bodies. They're nodules <coughs> found on the heart in individuals that suffered from rheumatic fever. Um, they're a classic result of inflammation of the myocardium that's not due to a myocardial infarct. You get connective tissue that's inflamed, there's a wound that takes place, there's scarring, it eventually resolves and it leaves a piece of tissue that is no longer functional. Example of a type two. Question back here, and then Sharon. So, what happens when you keep getting stuff though? Because I get it like four times a year. Wouldn't I be producing antibodies that like recognize it, and I wouldn't be getting this thing? Yeah. So, um, a, you should probably use your own water bottle from now on. <laughs> um, but B, um, so the reoccurring strep infections. Uh, some patients are much more susceptible to strep infections than others. Okay. Uh, so that's that's you. Um, and, and you do tend to grow out of it. Mm -hmm. Like, um, it's usually a childhood, young adult phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And then, like, when you get old, like me, you have other problems, but not strep throat. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's good news, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Karen. Um, sorry to avoid completely. Is type 2, is that where you're going to see, like, the pediatric, like, kidney failure for when the strep is first, or is that the more of the type 2 complex? It's usually the type 3. Okay, 
so possible outcomes of type two. And I'll give you some other examples, not just Ashcroft bodies. Um, but the possible outcomes when uh, the body encounters this antibody um, is to opsonize it. That's the single the cell that has the antibody that's bound to the antigen for phagocytosis. Eat it. Gulf it, engulf it, chew it up, digest it, and get rid of it. That's the defense mechanism. Um, so that's one possible outcome. The second possible outcome is an inflammatory event, right? Inflammation is a defense mechanism. Going back to our previous lectures, these are normal processes. Like all of these processes of phagocytosis, inflammation, right? To neutralize the threat, the threat is the antibody bound to something. Unfortunately, in this case, with a type two hypersensitivity, it bound to your own tissue. It wasn't supposed to cross react with your own tissue. Okay, so that's where the things, that's where the wheels fell off the bus. That's where it went awry. But inflammation is a normal thing, but it shouldn't be happening here. And so we trigger complement stimulation, we trigger neutrophil infiltration, and then subsequent macrophage infiltration, and we're actually trying to fight some sort of battle in our own tissue, and the only reason it was triggered is because of the antibody bound to an antigen, and that antigen happened to be normal myocardium. Okay? So, as we move forward, what are some other examples of type two? So blood transfusions, um, um, which is like a 200-year-old example. Um, we've got um, Ashcott body formation, which is a result of uh, rheumatic fever or patients that suffer from rheumatic fever or strep infection. And then we've got two more here on this slide, which are myasthenia gravis and Graves disease. So let's tackle the second one first, Graves disease, which is the arrow that goes down to the bottom uh, left of the slide. So in Graves disease, your body manufactures antibodies. Your body manufactures antibodies. I guess that's accurate. Body uh, manufactures antibodies. And these antibodies um, in Graves' disease, they bind to the TSH receptor. And the TSH receptor is found on the surface of thyroid cells, right? So the thyroid is basically in the, um, in the throat, okay, area, just above the heart. And the thyroid makes thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. And those thyroid hormones have metabolic influences. And the TSH antibody that binds to the TSH receptor uh, triggers that receptor uh, to be um, stimulated. So it mimics the activity of TSH. And TSH usually comes from what organ? What's that? Thyroid? No. Pituitary, which one? Anterior pituitary, right? So the anterior pituitary, so the hypothalamus, right, re releases the releasing hormone, binds to the anterior pituitary, the anterior pituitary releases the thyroid stimulating hormone that binds to the thyroid, and that triggers the thyroid to make its hormone. You guys remember all that? Okay, we'll get to the, we'll, we'll have an endocrine section, we'll get there, okay? But it wouldn't be a bad idea to take a look at that again. So there is no activation from the hypothalamus or the anterior pituitary. The antibody binds to to the TSH receptor and tells the thyroid make met metabolic hormone. And so in Graves' disease, you've got the thyroid that's overactive. You have hypo or hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism by overstimulation of the thyroid because of an antibody that binds to the receptor, turning it on when it's not supposed to be on. So if your metabolism goes up, you tell me what some of the side effects are of Graves' disease. Hyperactivity, okay. What do you think about heart rate, up or down? Up, okay. What do you think about weight itself, up or down? Down, down. they usually lose weight, okay. They have, they have trouble sleeping because they have a racing heart when they try to go to bed. Okay, your metabolism is jacked up in Graves' disease, okay. Nothing's happening from the pituitary in the brain. Everything is happening because the thyroid is being stimulated by a antibody that binds to the TSH receptor. Okay, myasthenia gravis, bottom right. Also a type two hypersensitivity. In myasthenia gravis, you have an antibody that binds to the acetylcholine receptor 
uh, postsynaptic side of the junction. So you've got the neuromuscular junction. You have the nerve, and then you have the muscle, and you have this gap. And acetylcholine, right, is the chemical signal that goes from the nerve over to the muscle to tell the muscle to contract. You guys remember all this? This is like 201. The Graves disease is 202 example. The myasthenia gravis is 201 example. So in 201, you got the nerve, you got the, the gap between the nerve and the muscle. Without acetylcholine crossing over, you get no propagation of the action potential and you get no muscle contraction. So what happens here is you still release acetylcholine in the cleft, but the antibody in this type two hypersensitivity binds to the acetylcholine receptor and blocks it. So it binds here and blocks it, prevents acetylcholine from binding. So what happens to the muscle side of the neuromuscular junction? It doesn't respond. So it's this disease, myasthenia gravis, uh, in, in the Greek means literally uh, muscle weakness is the name of the disease. That should make sense, right? Okay, these are type two hypersensitivities. All right, type three and four as we categorize this. We'll talk about type three and then we might, we'll take a break and then we'll come back and talk about type four, how's that sound, okay? So, actually, let's take a break now. Let's take a break now and we'll do three and four, okay?